brothers do you recall when the grasslands reach to the horizon? And the deafening roar of countless wings overhead. Back when Rome was a village at Britain, the Emerald Island. Before we gave up on our future and buried our dead. Okay. Hello, everybody. So we are going to go ahead and start. We are on episode 31, our part two of African discussion. Uh, to those of you who are not, uh, you know, have not seen the first episode, I just want to let you know that I am not the most foremost expert on Africa. So if anybody knows more than me, or if anybody has anything to add in comments and so forth, um, we would love to hear from you. But before, before we start today, along with our usual shout outs to Marvine, um, and uh, also um, shout outs to some of the other uh, podcasters, specifically Russian podcasters, Bushwhacker, um, and also a very famous Russian linguist, talented young Russian linguist by the name of uh, Georgi Starostin, whose linguistic material we may be using today if we get to it. So we're going to go back to Africa. And since my, again, my knowledge of Africa is somewhat convoluted and not exactly perfect, I'm going to pull up some images that I'd like to share with you. So let me go ahead and open up my images. So we're just going to go really quickly over with what we talked about last time. And this is stolen from Apostles. Um, the gentleman's name is Apostle um, a Podcast. Um, I am not referencing it below this video, though I probably should because, uh, well, his uh, uh, vernacular is very vernacular in his podcast, but his information is correct and the maps are excellent. So I wanted to show them to you. So basically, this is just a very quick, quick recap. So uh, people in Africa generally, uh, when the, the, the first humans appeared in Africa, they were kind of uh, limited by the terrain. The rainforest got in the way much. So if you were going to migrate, you had to migrate along the savanna and away from the rainforest and the mountains. Um, so originally people kind of were migrating somewhere in this general area. And uh, this is a very approximate, of course, uh, scheme. And uh, back then, the Lake Chad was not the smallest lake we have today. It was a very large lake along that was known as Mega Chad. And along with the Lake Congo, it formed a very important water resource in Africa that um, has been drying up ever since and has pretty much shrunk to nothing today. And so people, I mean, again, very rough approximation, people migrated away and they migrated to the um, near, uh, yeah, the, the, the Niger River and um, Valley. And that's where people according to some studies, may have domesticated uh, cattle. Some of the cattle may have domesticated goats and so on and so forth. That's very much debated. But the first uh, beginnings of pastoralism began, which is different than large-scale herding because with pastoralism, you have a small herd and you don't eat your, the meat of your cattle. You actually drink the blood and the milk of your cattle and the, your herds remain fairly small. Another thing that happened in the Niger River was more crowded living which oftentimes um, led to mosquitoes and sets of flies, which devastate the cattle and the people. First civilizations kind of originated somewhere in this area, plus or minus, and then people started migrating back out again. Okay, anyway, so people after that migrated to basically what's today Sahara, which was at the time very green and very plentiful land, with a lot of pastures, with a lot of grazing animals, and where civilization um, originated, which may have given some of its resources to the formation of um, Egypt at this time when we're talking about, which was many thousands of years ago, before the formation of early Egypt, the River Nile Valley was still very swampy and entirely unlivable. It didn't become more livable until Sahara began forming and uh, the continent started drying up in that region. So people developed bronze. There was, there was a place known as Dar Tichet, um, about uh, 2000 BCE to 5000 BCE um, in the Niger River Valley. It's older than now, like I already said, there was there's rock art that's found from it, uh, dating as far back as 4000 BC. Uh, bronze was discovered and uh, produced in that region because it had a small amount of tin, which allowed them to convert their copper to bronze, as we know tin is required for that. And um, various um, early signs of agriculture, which was most likely not widespread like it is in Europe, but it was more along the lines of uh, dropping a few seeds, coming back at the end of the season, gathering up those seeds. Um, people were not very inclined to an agricultural, in the sense of planting and gathering uh, crops. Uh, lifestyle because there was quite a bit of uh, plentitude of resources all around them. Well, all of that started drying up uh, with the advent of the Sahara Desert, and that's where my next map goes. 
and the, the um, people started migrating away from that region and they started migrating somewhere where it was more um, plentiful of water. And uh, some of those migrations were the Bantu people, which we have not talked about, but we're going to talk about a little bit further on and the Bantu people and their migration kind of overran these sections of Africa and uh, in the process wiped out a lot of the local languages, just like the Indo-Europeans and their migration into Europe wiped out a lot of the old, Euro well, all, pretty much all except maybe one or two uh, of old European languages. Uh, and in the process of their migration, somewhere in the area of Tanzania, they encountered iron, which the locals have figured out how to produce and to make various tools out of. So Africa jumped right from Stone Age. And I'm talking about, of course, Africa minus Egypt. Egypt is its own separate civilization, but Africa jumped from Stone Age directly into the Iron Age. And then they spread this use of iron um, along the journey throughout the rest of Africa. That's very quick and very short um, oversight. I'm going to stop, see if anybody has anything to add to it. Curious about your commenting that they use bows and arrows. Uh, do you have any idea when that began? Because I know bows and arrows are a fairly recent invention um, looking at all of humanity. David wants to comment on that a little. All I know is that there is rock art in that region that does show people with bows and arrows. So um, I think that in Africa may have been fairly um, archaic innovation. David, do you want to jump in? Some of the earliest points, it's hard to distinguish between Alente points, spear thrower points, and arrows sometimes. But smaller uh, arrowheads or projectile heads uh, show up in South Africa about 100,000 years ago in the very tip of, of South Africa as some of the earliest on Earth. And you're, you're getting missile weapons Generally, invention of the bow, some of the earliest may have been 40,000 years ago, but that's debatable. That's quite debatable. Up until recently, when I was in school, they figured it more like 10 or 12,000. They got pushed back. A missile weapon was what allowed sapien to probably dominate over other human groups. Um, but there you go. I'm comparing that to where I live in the Yukon, that they're they're finding at adult darts that were you know five to eight thousand, ten thousand years ago. So they weren't weren't using bows until perhaps five thousand years ago. There is a, uh, just a quick comment. There there is a, there is evidence that the development of the bow and the arrow uh, was a was a was it a con, uh, concurrent invention that that um, kind of like a like a like a like a rising in consciousness that it developed at the same point, roughly at about the same time, around the world. And the, uh, the, 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 best, um, uh, the best studies that I've read is when they've actually found projectile, arrow projectile points embedded in animals. And that gives a, that gives a very uh, solid, a, a, much more, a much more solid date as to when this was actually used. And there's evidence of that going back 20,000 years. Uh, Nathan, I'm going to ask for your help um, in proper terminology because I was the modern political correctness jumping all around. What do we call Bushmen today properly? Is it Kaisan people or what do we call them? Because it, it seems to be like, I, I'm not sure what's politically correct nowadays. And it's, I'm not trying to offend anyone, but the terms seem to change quicker than anyone, any of us can follow it. Yeah, but, but, but what, what I've read, and, and may, maybe, maybe what I'm reading is dated in uh, today's, you know, by today's standards. And that's what they're referred to as. I mean, what, what's socially acceptable in Africa? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same. And there are people that postulate they're a, a separate a type of people called Congoid, as a, that they're not Negroid, they're Congoid, but uh, that's getting very fancy. So I, if I use the term Bushman, I'm not going to horribly politically offend anyone. For like a, since I'm mostly going to be uh, you know, referring to the linguistic family, it's going to be mostly Kaisa. Um, just a couple more uh, groups that I want to go over before I get to the Bantu people in depth that I didn't get a chance to do so before. One of them is the people we were just discussing, and that's proverbial Bushmen, people formerly known as Bushmen. Um, Kaisar, um, Kaisana group, language group, um, these are probably the most... Um, interesting people in the sense of linguistics at least um, and also in the sense of culture on uh, 
large groups, the remaining groups uh, that most likely were there prior to the Bantu migration. We will get to the Bantu in a minute, but um, these are the people whose languages are most unique. They're the people with the click languages. Uh, you know, that sounds like t, t, and other sounds that are incorporated into their um, language that is very unique and exclusive to Africa. And we will get to the linguistic debate and what that means. Uh, they're the people with the most um, original, I guess, for, I'm trying to find politically correct term, most, uh, I don't want to say archaic, <laughs> um, ketonic, ketonic um, customs and uh, behaviors, or at least they were in the 17th century when the travelers were describing them. Um, have the most um, genetic diversity of any people on the planet. Yeah. Right, most genet genetic diversity and uh, a lot of adaptations that we see in later humans and or sometimes don't see in later humans are also seen in these people. These people are quite unique and there's some debate that these might be um, not the people who, it, you can't say about any modern population that they are um, basically somebody who is surviving from the past, but they are the ones who most closely evolved or, you know, developed from the original population of that region of Africa before the Bantu migration kind of overran that region. Um, the, they're understudied, uh, their languages are quickly disappearing. I mean, they're down to almost nothing. Uh, I think a couple dozens of languages left today. Um, they're different tribes. Um, uh, for then also in that region is people who are oftentimes referred to as pygmies and also the shortest statue people who are oftentimes forest dwellers. That is uh, something that we see around the world over and over. Um, there were people described as pygmies in Australia. Uh, there are people like, described as pygmies in Flores, uh, Island of Flores. Uh, it seems when people are generally limited to forest, like rainforest living, they tend to shrink in stature because it's a lot more economic to fit into those spaces and to be effective within that limited space of a rainforest when you're small a statue. Their languages are very diverse. Their cultures oftentimes are very closely intermingled with the agrarian cultures that is surrounding them. Oftentimes they trade brides back and forth. Oftentimes it's just one direction. Um, so there's a lot of admixture and a lot of linguistic admixture. And it's fairly hard to say whether or not those people represent a separate genetic branch or whether or not those people are just just a variation of, of the agriculturists that moved out into the rainforest for whatever reason, uh, whether economic pressures, social pressures, or um, evolutionary pressures of some kind. But they're definitely very unique and they're probably some of the last hunter-gatherers left on the planet today um, of the very few that are actually remaining. And then we have the Bantu people. The Bantu people is a very large group of, um, let me pull up my map again here. So they're the people who brought Iron Age to Africa. They are the Indo-Europeans really of Africa. They're the people who have very slowly and very, um, with much difficulty migrated across pretty much the whole continent with the drying of Sahara. And it took them hundreds if not thousands of years to do so because again, as we talked last time, that sense of lies devastate the herds. Uh, the mosquitoes with the malaria devastate the human populations. But these are the people who were fairly successful. They did the discover um, in Tanzania. Again, they picked up um, the skill of Ironborg, improved upon it. They had spread it throughout the remain, remaining Africa pretty much, and they came to dominate majority of this region, most likely displacing all of the original peoples and languages in that area very long time ago. And these are the people who later contributed to the formation of much later uh, Middle Ages uh, African empires, kingdoms, for example, such as Great Zimbabwe, which is much, much later than the time period we're talking about now. And so we're not going to talk, the, uh, talk about Great Zimbabwe right now because this is more or less recent times. But that's really great kind of quick oversight of that. And then I want to talk about one more region and that's the Lake Victoria region. And I need to pull up that map. Uh, but the Lake, Lake Victoria region, um, was obviously populated for quite a long time um, prior to modern day, obviously. But um, how old the cultures around that region are today is not very well known. There's some debate about it. Let me see if I can find my Lake Victoria. There it is. Okay, let me share my screen. Right by Uganda and Kenya. Huh? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Okay, so uh, Lake Victoria is in this neighborhood, and the, these are some of the main, um, you know, as I've talked about, the, the rivers are a very important part 
of um, African civilizations or any sort of city planning, because in order to survive in Africa, you have to have certain conditions. One of those conditions is you have to have um, savanna. You have to have be beyond the edge of the rainforest. You have to have access to water. And you have to have a situation where your, uh, you know, your rain season is balanced because if it's not balanced, you're either going to dry up or you're going to drown. So there are very few um, areas in Africa that are useful for agriculture as we know it here in Europe. But around the Lake Victoria, Nyaza, that's Tanzania, Nyaza people, uh, there is, has been discovered a platform fishing civilization that is most likely an offshoot of the Bantu people. Uh, that have given up their warlike traveling ways and have switched over to fishing. Again, this is um, a review that I read. Modern studies might have updated, you know, changed that. But from what I understand, these are people who more or less, because of their limited resources around the small area of the lake, have more or less renounced warfare in large quantities. And the warfare mostly takes place in a form of competition, where a few, at least it did up until recent times, where a few select warriors will battle sometimes to the death but the rest of the population will just observe and cheer on. Yes, the sand in particular, both the terms sand and the term Bushman can be taken as both of them are exagams. They were um, used to describe people that didn't have property, they didn't have cattle, they didn't have that kind of thing. So, um, Sand became the more popular term for a little while, and then it's now reverted back to Bushmen, apparently. When I was in school, they called them the Kunk, which is only a small group from Queen Charlotte's Islands, I believe, with uh, the Kung with a exclamation at the front of it to the, uh, denote that clicking sound. Um, but they are a very important people. Yeah, yeah, like that. Uh, they are a very important people in teaching us what hunters and gatherers live like. They, their children play pretty much all the time. They're leisure, they typically spend four hours a day on average in subsistence activities. And they consider themselves, or did traditionally, they're being brought into the industrial world now, obviously. But uh, they considered themselves wealthy uh, in their lifestyle. And uh, they are very important with other groups like the Inuit and uh, the Aboriginal peoples, the Dreamtime peoples of Australia. They uh, teach us kind of what uh our ancestors might have done uh how how we might have lived prior to agriculture and pastoralism and all of that so they're they're very important people uh they speak three different language groups uh, what i just read yeah. um three from three different families which is likely family, three subfamilies, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, that's it's very likely that there were diverse language groups there because they were small populations. But, um, I they're one of my favorite peoples, uh, just because they teach us so much. I can recommend watching the movie The Gods Must Be Crazy. It's about the people in that area. And uh, it, although the, the, the movie is definitely a farce, it's a comedy, uh, it does have a lot of truth about the people. Yeah. So people, since we still have 30 minutes, are you, and since discussion of Africa is really perilous just due to political and uh, social situation right now, I would like to tackle this from, you know, in order not to accidentally offend anyone of us in inappropriate terminology, I'm going to try to tackle this from a linguistic point of view, because I think the linguistic situation um, is a fairly good way to look at the <clears throat> populational situation in a non-migrant, um, um, basically we're leaving out all the um, recent um, migrants to Africa, you know, the Arabic peoples, the, the Arabic peoples, the Europeans and so forth, and we're looking at the root um, languages of Africa. Are you guys okay with this? Yeah, actually, the language situation is pretty interesting. Uh, 
for example, uh, my, my father was in Kenya, my, both parents actually, and they spoke Swahili, which is a combination of Bantu and Arabic um, amongst other things. And there's no swearing in that language at all because the people there are very polite, which is interesting because they tried, and Arabic is fabulous for swearing, but they tried the, tried translating things into Swahili, it just didn't work. Right. So I'm going to have to back up and explain a little bit about linguistics in general. Um, because there's two different schools of linguistics, linguistics in the world. There is the United States form of linguistics, which is oftentimes statistical. And then there's the Russian really old school of linguistics, which is based on the old German school of linguistics pre-World War II, everyone. Uh, and that is the co uh, comparativistical uh, linguistics. The, the difference between the two is that the Western school, which, you know, the American school, which most Western scientists, not all, but a lot of them follow, uh, basically involves plugging a lot of data into a computer and then running comparisons, which is great and fun. The reason why I'm a proponent of the comp uh, comparativistic school of um, linguistics is because it is a lot, the, the goals of these two schools of linguistics are different. One is to make basically statistical comparisons and make decisions on what languages may or may not be related based on the statistics. The objective of the Russian school of linguistics um, is to reconstruct um, extinct languages. And how can this be done? So the way they do it, there is a germ, I mean, this has been started in 19th century and it's been going on ever since. This is a very slow and very um, meticulous job work. Uh, to, for example, to reconstruct um, the origin, origin language or the root language for let's say 10 uh, Indo-European languages, uh, what you have to have is to have complete dictionaries of all those languages, complete grammatical rules of all those languages. You have to by hand because you cannot, I mean, you can use the computer to assist you, but a lot of it is done by knowing all those languages. So the scientist has to be more or less fluent in all of these languages, at least fluent enough to understand them. And you have to compare them more or less by hand, uh, com compare what they call the root um, lexicon, which are the basic words like mother, father, hand, water, um, earth, foot, um, nose, ear, and so on. So th those are th that's what's considered to be the, the root lexicon. Um, familiar relations, body parts, uh, concepts that are absolutely necessary, food, water, cold, um, things like that. I mean, obviously, um, those are going to be the, that that's going to be the basis of your lexicon in any language that is, uh, every child learns earliest on and is slowest to change over time. It changes so much more gradually than all the other words, and it's very unlikely to be borrowed from a nearby language. Um, those words are oftentimes remembered because you learn them from your mother early on, and they're usually very, fairly stay stationary in a language kind of mutate very slowly. So to reconstruct an orig origin language for a family of languages, let's say we have Indo-European languages, let's say we have Russian, Belarusian, Ukrainian, and a couple other languages in that group, uh, which is smaller languages, you know that they had a base language that was, that, that they all diverged, diverged from. Um, in order to reconstruct it, you have to compare that those that, first of all, you have to remove all the borrowed words from each language. And there's scientific ways of determining which words are borrowed. And then there is usually certain linguistic rules for how words mutate from one language to another. And it's almost always consistent. Well, it's always consistent on certain terms. So for example, um, Russian шесть, which is six, is an equivalent, uh, an equivalent to um, Latin sexton. So you know that sh in Russian language always changes to, you know, the C letter, which is where the English language got it from in the Latin and so on and so forth. For example, American Barber is a Greek Varvara. Byzantine is Byzantine Empire. So you have those correlations where certain sounds within a language mutate and there's, and it always mutates. But when one language changes into another, all those sounds all mutate. Does that make a little bit of sense? And that is called the correlate, basically the linguistic or the phonetic correlations. Um, and that is what linguists use to kind of relate the languages, find out that they have similar lexicons, and then they try to find the medium between all these languages and reconstruct the language they came from. Now, of course, you can't reconstruct the entire language. You can only reconstruct, reconstruct the roots for the base words in that language. For example, that using that method uh, in the European, Proto-Indo-European has been reconstructed in very small form, but uh, enough to have a base lexicon of, you know, basically I went over the river to gather water, those kind of sentences. And of course, a lot of it is approximation, but in those are not actually intended to be, you know, resurrected spoken languages. They're used for linguistic 
reconstructions because once you reconstruct the smaller families, and like for example, Russian, Belarusian, and uh, Ukrainian, you reconstruct their uh, base language, and then you take all the Germanic languages and you reconstruct them to their base language. Well, then you can take those two base languages and start reconstructing them to their origin language. And then you add on the Baltic languages and so on and so forth. And of course, the more information you have on a language, the further back in time you can go. Now to reconstruct just one of those base families, you know, where you take 10 very well-known European languages into European languages, it takes about 10 to 15 years for a single scientist of their lifetime of really vigorous work to be able to achieve that to some degree. So it's a very time consuming process and you have to learn languages to do this. Now within the European, this has been done and with some of the other Eurasian languages groups, this has been done fairly successfully because we have a lot of written records. The problem with African languages is with very few exceptions, we have no written language records and no phonetic history, no grammatical history, no record at all about of a lot of these languages. So the only way we can really work with them is by approximation and intuition. Now, of course, a lot of these linguists, for example, Starostin and Starostin's father, who unfortunately died fairly young, tragically died in the midst of his uh, studies, um, was a great linguist. I mean, some of these linguists have amazing intuition. They know so many languages, they start picking up different things, but intuition is not scientific method. And so in order to, to prove your intuition, you have to prove these correlations. You have to do mathematical calculations because linguistics, unlike a lot of other humanitarian sciences, is actually a mathematical science. It's a science that involves more or less formulaic approach. Uh, these correlations are very much, um, they're formulas that they apply to prove these correlations. So, of, and the goal of the um, comparativistics is to eventually, hopefully, in fantasy world, reconstruct the very first original language of humanity. If we would take into consideration that such a language may have at one point in time existed, if we believe the evolutionary theory, if we believe that all humans originated from the same original ancestor, if we believe that original ancestor migrated out of Africa somewhere in Africa once upon a time, um, ancestors of hum modern humans were speaking very first language that then kind of separated and grown into this multitude of languages we have on our planet today. So, of course, linguistics in Africa were not very well known, and nobody was particularly interested in African languages, uh, really. Um, up in the 19th century, they were not very well studied, because a lot of the Europeans that came to Africa to um, variously um, exploit the resources of that continent, the least they were interested in were the languages. The people who were most interested in the local languages, of course, were various Christian missionaries. And they were most interested in those languages because they needed to translate the Bible to those languages. And they also needed to be able to preach to the local peoples in those languages. So um, originally Europeans mainly just focused on the basic communication languages that were the large and well-known in Africa languages, Swahili being one of them, because it was just convenient for, commun for communication or uh, various languages that had Arabic, Ar Arabic influence in them because they were more familiar to the European travelers and was more convenient for communication. And they were just generally used as a trading language, as a bartering language, as a communication language. That was simple. The missionaries started creating dictionaries and grammars. Um, the kind of the big point in the history of African language studies is 1854, where a German um, missionary, Sigismund Kölle, published a dictionary of over a hundred of African languages. The way that he learned those languages is he sat where he sat, which was Sierra Leone in modern day. And he interviewed the slaves that were being driven past him to the markets um, being sold. And, but he did leave very meticulous records of over a hundred African languages. And that dictionary to this day is used by linguists it's both the, their kind of treasure and the bane of their existence because some of the languages described um, in this dictionary. They cannot find anywhere, they cannot place them anywhere. So the question is, was this an error of records or whether those languages simply ceased to exist since that time? But the, you know, missionaries oftentimes took very good, very meticulous records. I'm gonna stop for a second, see if anybody has anything to say. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about other parts of Africa, but I know certainly in East Africa, the Swahili, which you mentioned, is a, is a trading language of, of, like it's the language that everybody spoke uh, sort of on top of um, their local language, much like how Greek was used in the Mediterranean all over the place, even during the Roman Empire. 
Great. And from what I understand, Swahili is not terribly hard for Europeans to learn. At least that's what I heard. No, no, it's not. And it's actually, it, it's a language that grows and adapts. And it is a, it is a trade language. And uh, so English has now become a very large part of Swahili as a trade language. It's so it, it's a very adaptable, mutable, uh, progressive language. That makes sense. And it's convenient for communication that everybody can talk it and everybody can understand it and everybody can. I know that classes, for example, in Maasai land sometimes are taught in Swahili and other places uh, where there's smaller tribes, schools will be taught in Swahili, which is kind of a problem because people are losing their local languages. Yeah, it's the lingua franca. Sorry, I'm having border of malfunctions constantly here. So, a serious uh, classification work on all this. So, a bunch of information was accumulated about different African languages, but this was just, you know, kind of episod episodical information here and there. And it may have been accurate, but it was not classified. And serious classification work did not begin until the beginning of the uh, 20th century, where Karl Mein Kampf and um, Titrix Westermont first attempted to uh, kind of uh, systemize and kind of classify the system, but it was, it's very complicated. How do you classify African languages? It's, African languages are so diverse and sometimes so far removed from each other where intuitively linguists would pick up the sense that they are similar, uh, but they would not be able to present any clear correlations like they would be able to on the Eurasian, uh, basically linguistical examples, to be able to prove any sort of actual correlation between the languages. And another problem is that in Eurasia, language families are small. Uh, in other words, uh, in the Europeans ran over majority of Europe and they pretty much wiped out all the local languages. Uh, even if the populations were not necessarily displaced or replaced the languages because the, usually the more prestigious, just like with the Roman Empire, the more prestigious, the more uh, commercial, the more successful uh, cultures, language oftentimes dominates the local languages. And even if the local groups survive, they take on the languages of the invading majority, basically successful majority, just like English today is kind of dominating the world. Uh, just like Russian and the, you know, Russian empire was dominating, um, it's just the most successful neighbor's language oftentimes is the more prestigious ones, one. Well, the, those the language families are fairly small in Europe, even Asian language families, I mean, they may be within a hundred, like in the European uh, language family has maybe plus or minus a hundred different languages in it. To where in Africa, you have hundreds and thousands of languages and it is very difficult to classify them because what you wind up with is hundreds of fam uh, language family groups and it's very hard to work with for linguists. So too many languages, too many uh, linguistic families. Um, and so what some of the early um, people who tried to systemize and kind of classify languages started doing, they started mi mixing concepts, they started mixing pure linguistic data with um, not only anthropology, but also with the, the typology of the language. What I mean by typology, for example, in African languages, uh, the concept of gender is fairly uncommon. To us in Europe, I mean, in a lot of European languages, not so much in English, but in a lot of them, the concept of a noun having an inherent gender is very commonplace. Uh, for example, in Russian, a spoon is female, a knife is male, coffee is a neutral gender. And that's true for Spanish and a lot of other languages. Um, but for African languages, that got, they have a different kind of a concept that, that oftentimes um, colors the way that nouns are pronounced, the way that, the, the way that nouns are grammatically used. Um, and that is the concept of uh, classes. Um, oftentimes, for example, what do I mean by that? So a noun will be differently inclined um, based on whether it's describing a human, type of human, uh, a type of an animal, a type of a tree, a type of a rock. Or for example, another example of classes would be round versus uh, square objects and so on and so forth. So there are classes in African languages. So um, typology, what means that you decide that, okay, this language uses gender and that language uses gender, they must be related. Well, that's not necessarily true. Two language groups could independently do, uh, evolve a concept such as use, use of gender in their language. Does that make sense to everyone? So early classifications were not very useful. And so around 30s and 40s of the 20th century, the situation was more or less a mess. I mean, everybody knew about the Bantu, 
uh, and they knew that that was uh, in Central and South Africa, plus there was the Kaisar language group, which was distinct always, and everybody knew that they were distinct because they were so unique. Um, the rest of it was more or less geographically zoned because people didn't know how to group them together. And total um, of four, you know, 400 to 600 different languages uh, in the, just the Bantu family alone that are close to each other and very similar, and yet distinct enough to raise questions. An American researcher who started in 1940s and continued from that point on, Greenberg, came up with a classification system that we pretty much use today that uh, leaves a lot of room for questions and doubts. What he did is um, he um, kind of, I'm going to pull up a map of these languages because it's important to, and this is, like I said, this is the classification system that everybody knows is wrong, or at least not entirely right, but nonetheless today we're using it all the same because nobody's come up with anything better yet. And uh, for non-professionals, non-linguists, this is pretty much more or less has become the standard. First of all, we're gonna leave Madagascar out of our discussion because Madagascar got populated separately and it has its own linguistic group uh, that's not remotely related necessarily to African languages. So the main groups that were suggested uh, by uh, Joseph Greenberg, what was back then known as uh, the Congolese, uh, basically Niger Congolese group, which is nowadays broken up into two groups, but back then it included all these languages uh, in the in red and orange. The red one is what he originally proposed was kind of the belt. It includes Bantu, but it also includes languages that are kind of questionable on whether or not they um, related to Bantu. There's about a 10 or so plus or minus um, smaller languages that are more distantly removed from the Bantu language. It shows the, clearly the uh, linguistic expansion of Bantu peoples, um, where there's only this little um, kind of island of the um, original, but if we were to believe it, the original languages left, you know, in green, and that's the Bushman languages. Um, it, um, it seems to be correlated to uh, the use of metal. Um, again, that's applying non um, linguistic um, data onto linguistic maps, but unfortunately that's done oftentimes. And um, it's, it's probably one of the more debatable language groups. Well, one of the more debatable one. The next one that he proposed, that is the Nilo-Saharan language group. And this is this area right here. There's a lot of problems with that language group. That's one of the most questioned ones today, um, but it's the Sudan belt. It's very varied and seemingly much older languages than the Bantu languages. It includes the Maasai, Morsi languages, um, Sangai languages uh, is the furthest uh, west spread of that region. And uh, Sangai languages, by the way, are uh, uh, Songhe in the English language would be the remnants of the Songhe Empire, uh, which once dominated that region. Then the North African Eastern region would be what, what's called the uh, Afro-Asiatic language group, and that's the blue one. And again, that leaves a lot of room for question because what he did is he grouped together all the Semitic uh, languages such as Hebrew, uh, Akkadian, all of those uh, languages like that. Uh, Berber languages, uh, languages of Chad group, um, some Ethiopian languages, um, Nigerian Chad, you know, ling languages are included in there. And it also included in it as a separate branch, the ancient Egyptian language, which was not, um, it's not a Semitic branch, but it's, it's a separate branch that's closely related to that. And then of course, um, the Kaisan group, which is um, obvious to everyone that they are standalone, and that's far South Africa, small areas, um, and it's an oasis of languages here and there, and that's kind of nestling between the, uh, the dominant Bantu languages. Only 20 of those languages are alive today. Uh, in the 17th century, there, was, there were hundreds of them alive. Uh, we're losing them every day at absolutely lightning speed. So in order to um, make sense of all this linguistic diversity, um, you know, linguists more or less adopted this as a basis, there was much debate going on. I'm gonna stop and see, just give you guys a minute to jump in with anything else and then I'm gonna let David jump in. It doesn't take into account the people there that are speaking multiple languages. It's like quite common for people to speak three or four different languages, which might have different language groups as well. And a couple other, like the, the country of Nigeria, for example, alone has over 200 language families in it. Not languages, but language families. These are super, you know, they're super families, which is a whole different level. But, um, you know, minor families, just like I said, in the country of Nigeria alone, there's over 200 of them. 
Um, yeah. I think the borders are these things like they, they, they you have to draw a line between the colors, but in, in fact, they're very, very fuzzy borders for sure. Right. Yeah. This is a, that's why this is used as an approximation. Another thing is um, oftentimes people will say that they speak like what you will stop by one village and they will, I'll, you will ask them what language do you speak? And let's say they say, I don't know, make up a language name. Um, Morsi, and then you go a couple of villages over and you ask them what language to speak and they will say the same language name, but they won't be able to understand each other. So just because two villages claim to be speaking the same language doesn't mean they actually do it. I know that some of the Russian expeditions recently have discovered at least two unknown languages because they compared vocabularies or dictionaries between two neighboring villages and turned out that they were not mutually eligible at all. Oh, you know, I, I, I try to, I try to walk, walk through the neighborhoods of London and from one neighborhood to the other, I can't understand <laughs> what they're trying to say. And that's London. Right. Yeah. So this is considered to be a very rough um, approximation. So how ancient are those groups? I mean, when did these groups exist? You know, these groups, if we were to take them as at their, you know, face value. Well, dating methods and linguistics are still up for debate, but for example, the Russian group uh, prefers the concept that the language, the basis, basic le le lexicon within a language mutates at about the same rate all over the world, plus or minus. So in other words, those core words like mother, father, water, whatever, they're going to mutate at a roughly, it's kind of like in genetics, you can roughly tell like how quickly genes, when new mutations are likely to arise, when variations are likely to happen. It's very similar to genetics actually. So that gives um, very rough dates, uh, gives uh, around, um, for the Afro-Asiatic group, it gives around 12 to 10 uh, century BC. For the Niger Congolese, it gives about the same plus or minus a couple thousand years. For uh, Eastern uh, uh, Sudan, a subgroup of languages, it gives about 5th century BC. And Kaisan, it's unknown, but some of them are dating as, re as, free as recent as 5th century BC to 1st century BC, which is unlikely to be true. Bantu is coming up as about 4th century BC, very, very approximate. And all of these are popping up very young. Too young to be the languages from the cradles of human race as they everybody would expect them to be in Africa. Well, where did the remaining languages go? Where did the diversity go? Well, as I've already mentioned, the Bantu migration steamrolled over a lot of, just like it, uh, in the Europeans did over Europe, so that uh, the African tribes of the Bantu people, they roll over. And because of their use of iron and other technological advantages, they were able to roll over some of the local peoples and assimilate their, their languages at the very least. We don't know about the populations. The problem is, for example, with the Nilus um, Saharan family, if you start looking at it more closely, you start seeing that there's certain discrepancies in gr uh, grouping those languages together. Uh, for example, the uh, Nuri, Tabu, Sagala languages uh, are completely different in their basal lexicon from the other Nilus Saharan group. And so when you start looking at it closely, it starts falling apart. And if you start comparing those neighbor different dialects, I mean, they're so different that if you were to approximate the dating for those languages, they could be anywhere between uh, 20 to 100,000 BC when they would come together into a joint language group. Macro Sudan group, for example, is um, consists of about, I don't know, 10 to 12 smaller families. I mean, it's dating at about 12,000 southern BC, but there's so many, a uh, couple of, there's a couple of dozen of isolates there and nobody knows how old those isolates are. And no, they have not well enough studied, let alone linguistically compared. Because if we remember in order to be able to run that kind of a, you know, reconstruction, you have to have a full dictionary and full grammar and good understanding of all languages in that group that you have access to, to be able to bring them together. Well, we don't really have that for African uh, languages. Unique, uh, well, some of the African languages have unique ancient traits, or so it is supposed by some researchers. So when the click uh, languages were more or less accurately described and uh, became known to average Western researcher, there was much excitement because early genetic studies um, overlapped the map of the supposed distribution of the 17th century Kaisan population with the genetic diversity, uh, the most genetically diverse groups in Africa. And so the kind of the supposition was that, well, maybe those click sounds, which are not common in any other human language, the tsanko, I can't even pronounce it. It's my, my tongue is not designed for that stuff. But maybe those click sounds is something that archaic human languages had and that all other human languages lost them. And only this very ancient population maintained that particular quality of their language.
well, say people who study Kaisan languages, they say, why would you suppose that? Why not assume that base human languages did not have the click sounds? And then over the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years, that language group just happened to evolve them to where everybody else didn't. And it's one of those debates that cannot be proven either direction, and it's still raging. So that's, that's still very much up for discussion. Different um, Kaisan languages have various proportions of the click sounds in them, and some of them it's a very prevalent to where in other ones it's barely there. Bantu languages that are nearby, a lot of them, for example, Zulu language, have borrowed those sounds and incorporated them into their languages. And so Kaisanologists are very skeptical about this idea that the, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Click sound, whether or not it was a late uh, evolution or whether it was an early trade that everybody else lost. The depth so far that they've been able to reconstruct the Kaisan languages so far, and that's the Russian school of linguistics, who uh, during the Soviet times was not able to travel very much, but you know, Soviet Union had this great program where a lot of African students would come to Soviet Union and study in various universities. And so Russian linguists were able to interview those students and um, basically write down their languages based on those interviews and work very closely with them because a lot of them learn how to speak Russian while studying in Russia. Uh, so they were able to keep the database and so uh, they've been able to reconstruct the depth so far up but and by depth I mean how far in time to about 10,000 to 12,000 years ago but that's about as far as they're capable of going and maybe once more languages are better understood uh, more materials are reviewed more people work on this material we will learn a lot more about the population origins and linguistic origins of languages on the African continent and I think David wanted to jump in with something so I'm going to go ahead and sell it real quick. Julia is far better than I am on linguistics. Nonetheless, comparative ling linguistics is the best way to do it, mm -hmm. in, in my opinion. But sometimes you don't have that. You don't have as much data to work with as you did with Indo-Europeans. And in many ways, African languages are kind of like Native American languages in that they were disappearing so quick that people were frantically and every every day with many Native American tribes, elders die and languages are lost. Um, and so I think the statistical has tried to fill in the gaps. In Africa in particular, and sometimes Sometimes it is not a dominant population, it, or it's a dominant population, but it's not a numerically. They think many of the Indo-Europeans early on were minorities that were emulated, much like the Romans were emulated by the, by the Celts, the Celt elites. Okay. There, there's some complex ways, I mean, Anglo-Saxons are mostly Germans and Danes, and I mean, English are mostly Germans and Danes and Celts. Half of our language is, is Latin-based words, and that's, that's from Rome. But it, it's very complex. The heartland of where humanity arose, you know there were, like the so-called pygmy peoples of Africa, speak many of these language groups. But there's, there's, there may be, particularly among the Western groups, there may be an element of forest dwelling that hints uh, terms unique to the rainforest that may suggest some part of their population had a very old substratum that uh, spoke some other language because they don't appear in other Bantu or um, nilo Sudan type languages. So it's very complex and sapiens alone has been in Africa 300,000 years or more. Other genuses two and a half, three, four, three and a half million. So language has been evolving for a long time in some form or another. So it's very complex. I do believe as much as you can, and just like anthropologists in the Pacific Northwest, 
were gathering everything they could in 1920s and 1930s and on as much as as we can gather and with the ability to record languages that's a tool in our favor so basically to my, to our uttermost regret and shame i mean africa is on yet another territory that is just catastrophically understudied as much as europe has been studied and has been reviewed and kind of studied and studied again um, as much as Asia, certain parts of Asia have been very closely studied. Um, unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of regions that are still deeply understudied. So there's a lot we don't know about Africa. And uh, to follow up on what David said, I mean, I've, I've repeatedly heard appeals from linguists that if you happen to come on your travels across a language that is not very pop numerous, that is not very populous, it doesn't even have to be unique, it just has to be semi-rare, break out a tape recorder, break out your cell phone try to get at least basic, you know, basic uh, lexicon, try to get some information down, record what you can, because once the data is gone, once those speakers of that, those languages are gone, there's no going back to them. There's no reviving them. There's no finding out what's been lost. And some of these languages are extremely different from anything we can imagine, very unique. And they tell us a lot about the history of humanity as such. It's, it's very difficult to, um, how do you record a language that's not written? Very difficult. Now, today we have some technology that was not available to us 100 years ago. And, but what is, uh, for me, even more striking is that with the, um, with the loss of language, there's the loss of story and there's the loss of mythology. Mm -hmm. And that's even more, that's, to me, even more striking and, if you will, even more alarming. It's a loss of worlds. It's, it's a whole yeah. world. It's a loss of worlds. Yeah. I actually had a question. I don't know how, what other thoughts people have about this, but has there been a lot of use that anybody knows about, about the use of gestures and sign language? I'm pretty sure that's a separate science that is not nearly as developed. Put together. I've heard of some individual studies on the subject matter, but I have not um, you know, heard of such a discipline. I'm sure that some linguists probably venture in that general direction. It's not anything that's mainstream. I've seen some studies on this, like take, take on, uh, just of Europe, you think uh, Italians are, are known for using gestures a lot more than other countries, but, um, but th yeah, the people are actually studying this, although it's just definitely a subset of linguistics. Yeah, and, and neurophysics from what I understand, neurophysiology, right. biology and so forth. Yeah, um, I had the I had the good fortune of spending uh, roughly it, it wasn't quite a week up in uh, northeastern Uganda um, with some friends who were they were uh, attempting to study the Ik language, the forest people. Colin Turnbull wrote a book about the forest people and uh, about, about them and their language and they do not have a written language and so so how how do you how do you write how do you create a written language to document linguists have a phonetic system that has pretty much signs for almost all of human sounds that human throat can make that, mm -hmm. and if you know if you're a linguist you know that phonetic system and you will write down sounds that way uh, and for new sounds, the, like for example, when they came across the click languages, for example, why the exclamation point was before the word of the Kong, it was Kong, I can must Kong. But so they come up with new phonetic symbols for new sounds. Um, sometimes you just have to record the sound and explain what it is. But that's the only way you can really do it. Right, but, but, but uh, very much uh, to um, uh, speak to uh, Ryan's question, what they were finding was is that gestures, hand gestures, were a very uh, important part of their language. Well, I mean, even, yeah, I mean, even think about modern day military, the United States military, I mean, a lot of those military units wouldn't be able to communicate without hand gestures, because a lot of the communication goes on on the level of, and some of those hand gestures are involuntary, and other ones are quite voluntary, so it just, I mean, a lot can be said with a gesture that's not necessarily linguistically pronounced. I just wanted to kind of feed on the comment, um, that you guys were making about the the loss of culture and I know I've read a number of books that have done a lot of speculation on how much was actually lost and it boggles my mind that you know it's 
potentially up to 50% of the cultures and the, therefore the languages in sub-Saharan Africa were wiped out because of the slave trade. And that just, it's, it's saddening and mind boggling all at the same time. Absolutely. And, 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 and sorry, and I kind of had to jump computers, so. In, in Australia, about 90% of the Aboriginal languages have been lost. And I, I lived with a, a native shaman historian and she insists that the, the stories of the people have to be in the people's language. Because you, when you translate the stories into something else, you lose nuances and, and things like that. So keeping the languages alive keeps the culture and the stories alive and the history alive. And then again, there's always the, the never ending question of how do you keep the languages alive when, for example, you have a small you know, fishing village next to a big city and all the kids uh, want to go work in the city. They want to speak English, let's say, if that's the dominant language because that's what their friends speak in school. They don't care to learn their grandparents' language and the language slowly dies out. Not because anybody is killing it or oppressing it, but because the very, um, you know, like it's like the Etruscans, for example, when the Etruscans took on the Roman citizenship, they stopped speaking Etruscan, not because anybody was forcing them to, but because it was cool to speak Roman, to speak Latin. So, I mean, it's, it's a process that's almost unstoppable sometimes. Well, and, and it's also, it goes to a, a very base quality and that is survival. And language is part of survival and learning languages, multiple languages. Uh, learning, if, if you are in competition with a neighbor, you learn their language if you wanna survive. If they are a more powerful, affluent, uh, forceful neighbor, yeah, you learn their language. You can even say that about the use of English in a lot of the uh, United States versus like, uh, you know, parts of Europe. The, uh, the English that we speak, you know, here where I grew up in Redneckville, I mean, if somebody came over here from Britain, they would, what? What is he talking about? Because the slang alone just really works itself in. And that's how new languages form, actually. That's how you get from a language to a, to a dialect. You know, this famous saying is the dialect is a language without an army or navy, right? I mean, um, but that's how languages form is, uh, you know, somebody might have a speech impediment, for example, in a small population, and they pronounce uh, a certain sound instead of R every time they pronounce this L, for example, and so the R's transfer into L's. Or maybe it becomes hip or cool in that population to say instead, of, like in Moscow, for example, you know, Moscow is what you call Moscow all over Russia, except for Moscow, where you say Moscow. So Moscovites have a, a habit of ah, turning every O into an A, and it's just a regional kind of little trait that's just kind of cool and prestigious, but slowly, you know, the language is mutating that way. And it's then like, also, like also, Spanish in, from Spain in Latin America is different because apparently a Spanish king had a lisp. So people in Spain put the lisp in the language, which do, it doesn't exist in Latin America. Right. And so that's how language is transmitted. And that's a fairly good example. All right, guys, well, we're way over time. So um, next time let's reconvene on the 12th. Does that work for everyone? And I'm thinking we probably should go back to our Greeks because we might as well. And kind of gently, you know, migrate into Persians from there. I'm not ready to do China yet. We do need to do China, but not yet, not yet. I'm not ready for that undertaking. I'm slowly preparing for it. And maybe David will be doing that because I'm afraid. That is a very, very large task. All right, thanks, thanks everyone. It was an awesome discussion. If you have any other thoughts or anything like that, please comment please like us and uh you know i will add the donation link under this video thanks everyone bye, yeah. bye. that exist within every man's soul. Every man's and we will soul. live forever or as long as stories are told. Stories are told. Stories we are the archetypes that exist within every man's soul.